Welcome to the Notorious Scoundrels, a Star Wars Legion podcast bringing you the latest news, general perspective, and competitive discussion. Hello and welcome back to the Notorious Scoundrels podcast. I'm Kyle. I'm here with Mike and David and Zach. What's up, guys? Do you know what time it is right now? No. You're like out of it, man. Yeah, it's been a long day. I I went to Ikea, uh, a very long drive to Ikea. I disassembled and assembled three different pieces of furniture. And uh, yeah, here I am. So yeah. kids are asleep. So show us the bork. Yeah, show us the bork. Show us the mork. Oh, the mork. Oh, yeah. did, did you yeah, get one mork. of those? The Ikea beds have these like roll out um, like metal things that go across the bed. You know what I'm talking about? Like, what it the mattress goes on top of it. It's like the rungs. Yeah. yeah. Underneath, man. Well, it's, mine it's was like, a it's, real pain when I put mine together. It's, it's like two rails. You gotta you gotta screw the rails into the sides of the bed, yes. and then there's like 16 flat boards that you put in there, and then you do like little pinchy screws. Yes. Sorry, the flat boards yeah. is what I meant. Yes. It took a while. Yeah, I, I think I yeah. screwed it up like three times when I did it. Yeah. I think putting together furniture is like a like a bottom three thing you can do. It is it is low. I it's, hate it's putting together It's down there with furniture. moving. Yeah. I don't know. Well, no, moving's the worst. Hundred percent, moving is like number one, the worst thing. Um, like my wife, my wife is still holding out hope that we have potentially a third kid, which you know. I'm not really for it, but, and, but the, honestly, the main reason why, why I'm not for it is because we just bought a three bedroom house. Dude, you got, and, you got a three month old. This is like, well, no, no, I know, <laughs> but, but hold on. I'm just saying, here's what, here, here's what would happen, right? Let's say we go for kid three. I'd have another boy and, and, and my son is now three going on to four by the time we have this other kid, right? They're not going to, he's not going to share a bedroom with another kid. So we're going to have to take this three bedroom house and turn it into a four bedroom house, which means I'm going to have to move again. I don't and know, dude. Just I'm not buy doing bunk that. beds, man. It's not a big deal. It's not as simple as that. And in the early stages, it's not. And it would require another bedroom, and it's just not happening. I'm not moving for the like like the next ten years. I just moved. It's not happening for like ten. I mean, you could just sleep on the couch, right? No problem solved. <laughs> Sleeping on the couch as a dad is actually not bad. All right. It's really not. It's yeah. I actually sleep better. Anyway, you asked to see the Mork. This is this is yes. chocolate Mork. I was very pleased to see that the. I think this just mean this is just Swedish for dark chocolate, but I think it's hilarious. It's gonna I be wish... super awkward when it means something entirely different, and somebody looks yeah, yeah. it up and is like, "Man, you guys said some stuff on on cast." <laughs> well, I'm sure that I'm sure that IKEA would not have like profanity printed on there. On no, the how, how how sure are you? It would be <laughs> super like IKEA to be like, "Yo, we are." bad you know <laughs> and just like putting it out there now here's here's what we're gonna do mike's gonna put the uh, r2d2 noises in for the when we say mork instead instead of saying mork it's gonna be say yeah i got this chocolate mork but it's gonna be r2d2 noises you have to blur the mork when it shows up on screen yo <laughs> that'd, in, that'd be funny in other news can we all take a minute to be grumpy with kyle about scheduling casts during Patriots football games and being the reason that we're having a losing season. All right. So we normally record on Mondays. And last week, they played on Monday. They almost lost to the, the freaking Jets. Okay? The mojo is thrown off because of Kyle Dornboss. Okay? I, Mike and I talked about this earlier. And we normally record on Mondays. We're recording on Sunday this week. And guess what? The Patriots are playing Sunday Night Football. But here we are recording the podcast. And you know what's going to happen? We're going to lose to the Baltimore Ravens. Not because the Baltimore Ravens are a good football team, but because Kyle Dornboss, you know, Kyle Dornboss was like, no, we're recording on Sunday night. And it's during the Patriots game. That is the bad mojo. Yeah. That is why we're three and Unbelievable. five. Unbelievable. I'm calling, I'm calling Bill Belichick tomorrow and telling him that it is your fault. Just so you know. Wait, I'm sorry. I have really not been following football this season. The Patriots are actually three and five. Yeah. Let's yeah. See. And, and, and guess it's what? Painful. All <laughs> five losses, following. all five losses were during Notorious Scoundrels podcast recordings. <laughs> that, don't I think, don't I think that change. actually you know might what? be true. You know, it's if, close. It's if close. The Patriots want to call me up and work something out so we're not scheduling these at the same time. I'm happy to, uh, you know, 
I mean, I'm sure we can figure something out. Um, <laughs> anyway. Kyle Dormo is holding the Patriots winning season <laughs> ransom. <laughs> well, apparently it's not a winning season. Well, you know uh, what I mean. Well, it's what yeah. could be a winning it's season. It's what could have been. More yes, importantly. Yeah. Uh, anyway, let's talk about Legion. We actually have some real news to talk about. Welcome to In the News. So we got restocks. Yay. Um, I, I do not know the status of restocks at, at local stores. I have not... I did not hit any this weekend. Well, you didn't, but at least you didn't personally call every store in the nation to figure out which <laughs> stores had restocks and which didn't? What, uh, what kind I, of reporting is this, Kyle? <laughs> <laughs> I have not. But uh, for the, uh, folks, let us know if your local stores have restocks or not. We'd be curious. Um, but at least on FFG's website, they have restocks, notably of Phase 2s, B2s, and the Sabre Tank, which have been out of stock for a while. So they are currently still in stock, which means that they did not sell out in like a day, which is good. Uh, I have a confession to make. I bought six B2s. <laughs> <laughs> so in my defense, I had already bought two. And then I was like, part of me is like, this. it's possible this is going to be good. And I'll just buy four more. And I'll keep them in the box. Yo, do you remember and, all those DM chats I had with you where I was like, you know what, Kyle? I think six B twos are gonna be pretty good. And you were like, No, that can't be a thing. No, no. Here we are, like four months later, and you're like, you Well know that, what? that was I before they previewed the T series personnel upgrade. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Uh anyway, they're gonna stay in the box. I'm gonna I'm gonna mess around a little bit with six B two lists. And uh, if it's good, I'll open them and paint them. <laughs> so just so that everybody's clear, this whole decision was likely predicated on the fact that the T-Series says you lose AI attack. And it turns out that B2s with AI attack, without AI attack might actually just be really freaking good. And with Reliable. Yeah, too. and with Reliable well, because yeah. they get that free surge. So that card was previewed in the, one. I think, the Gen Con article for the um, uh, the personnel expansion. Yeah, the, the T1... The the T1 droid shoots at range three, correct? Yeah, it's a red dice at range right. three. Right, so you can you can pair it up with the blast weapon. Yeah, and then it's three and reds and a white with it's pretty, reliable at range three with it's blast. Pretty, it's pretty good. So it's and, basically three hits past cover, which if you're shooting into heavy cover, that's basically like five hits, which is a short trooper pool. Yeah. So, and that's before you factor in the <clears throat> super dope range two pool. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, and they're beefy, Absurd. like right. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah um yeah so anyway i uh i got some in case they run out and um 80 chance i'm gonna end up like giving them to someone else or selling them or something i mean but, uh, i am all for like when when you say cl when somebody says clone wars to me i imagine clones not fighting b1s but fighting hordes of b2s just like mowing each other down like i want to see that on the table and they're the fact, so cool looking they are they're so dope and they, they're yeah. basically just cylons right yeah um, right and uh, yeah they're awesome there, there's some great scenes in the tv show um particularly on like ship boarding actions where there's just like hordes of b2s that just drop from those drop pods and you got like like 50 60 b2s just marching in there with their lasers it looks so cool so i'm of course thinking of the genosis arena from attack of the clones yeah yep. you know that's yeah. that's yeah. like the iconic scene for me is the jedi fighting the b2s on the arena floor not a yeah, lot of iconic scenes but that's one of them that's yep. it, yeah not a lot Yo, of them, you know well, come on man that movie has a ton of <laughs> iconic scenes in it like what dex in his diner i Actually, hate sand i i, I <laughs> like I that sand. scene for what I, whatever it's worth it's also got yeah. the like one of the best lightsaber fights in it. Yeah, no, I'm not saying it's all bad. It's not all bad. It's Same. mostly bad. Man, Anakin everything goes that to does a not rave. Involve. Yoda gets ruined when he pulls out a lightsaber. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Don't. I, don't it is. Me. It is a movie that is. If you took a lot of the dialogue out of it, it would be good. Man, but it's got a lot of bad dialogue in it. That's or like, replaced that's it like, with good dialogue. That's worst yeah, Star sure. Wars movies ever. Though. Yeah, like let let's be real. The dialogue what? in Star Wars movies leaves something to be desired. That's not what the movies are about, for the most part. It, well, it, it's not like Oscar winning 
in the original trilogy, but it's, it's not, fine. Yeah, yeah you don't I mean, have the prequel. The, the, the prequel dialogue is like unwatchable. It's cringy yeah. Anakin on Naboo with Padme in Episode Two. It's it's like it's like B movie sci fi channel dialogue. Yes, at best, yeah. I'm okay with that. Have have, <laughs> have you watched Sharknado? I'm sorry, but absolutely but those not. Movies are great. <laughs> no, I will not give you that. To get us uh, back on track, I have yeah. a confession to make. Okay, go ahead. I was one of the lucky. Uh, look at you. you. To get one nice. of these, unbelievable. Um, and now that now that we were discussing phase two, that's why I left my screen to go grab this. My store probably got a restock, which I didn't notice because I ran in and out um, grabbing this, and it was probably a restock of phase twos. Is how they probably got the you know qualified for this Luke. Um, I have a lot of phase twos. That I've never mentioned on cast or on the internet because I didn't want to be killed for it. Um, so, um, yeah, your so I, I, <laughs> I've had four phase two since they dropped and like everyone started screaming about not having phase two. And I was like, I need to pull an Obi-Wan here and hide. Um, so yeah, I never looked to see if they had more phase twos and B twos. Uh, but I'm assuming because this is a week before Anakin and Maul hit that it was probably a restock that got this Luke in. Um, yeah, I was lucky. My, um, you know, here, here's something, right. Supporting your local store is like very important for stuff like this, because like my store didn't charge me for this. And I know it's going across the board. I know it's like a, a huge discussion on the Facebook, like left and right. And there's a lot of like negativity being thrown that way, but like supporting your local store one way or another, whether they're selling it to you or giving it to you is like super important. Um, especially now, like during these times where we're not using their play space and, you know, some stores probably charge for play space or don't like, it depends on, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of different, you know, stores are different. Like every store is different. Um, so whether they're charging, you know, 12, 20, 50, 75, hundred for that Luke, um, that's, you know, that's totally fine. It's not like they're going on eBay and scalping them. That's like a totally different thing. Right. Um, if the store is trying to sell it, you know, and try and make a profit because, you know, times are tough. I mean, that's, that's perfectly fine. And um, so however these stores want to distribute them, I think is okay. Um, I think, you know, we discussed this a couple episodes ago. Um, we knew this would be an issue. Like we knew. Still is an issue. Yeah. We knew this would be an issue. Um, but at the end of the day, don't fault the stores is what I'm basically getting at. Like it's, the, it's not the store's fault that, that this situation is in their hands. Um, it's more of the, you know, the distribution of it uh you know fall you know that's the problem not the stores just to remind everybody this is a retailer incentive it is not a customer incentive yeah i mean that's kind of like like yes you're right Mm -hmm. but i i feel like that's like a cop out for ffg to be honest like you know it's, it's not like retailers want this and and we already talked about this a ton i will say that of the three promotional models, I think this is the one that is like the least unique. And what I mean by that is like there's actually like a Skullforge mini that's like basically the same thing that you can pick up. Like and, and it's pretty good, frankly. Yeah. It's, it's like almost the same good pose. Third party Yeah. Um so I don't know. Um but yeah. It also seems like there's just more, like they're easier to get than, um, yeah, the S and Obi Wan and the Celebration Vader for whatever you know. Maybe it's just because of how they're being distributed that it's, you know, they're being sent all over locally. I don't know, but it just seems like there's more out there. They're not going for as outrageous prices on eBay. Um, no, you know, it seems I've seen lots of pics and stories of people actually getting their hands on them. So, yeah, I've seen people going on like the buy sell trade. And they're trying to trade like the Luke for like a Vader and Obi Wan, and no no offense to any of you if you're listening if you posted that you know what power to you if you think you're gonna make that trade that's fine but let me tell you this that trade is awful that is an awful trade for an Obi Wan or a Vader holder because those are definitely quote unquote more exclusive well like those are more hard to come by than these Lukes I feel like th- that's probably fair but I think the other thing with Legion though is that like. You know, these are these are minis that belong to a particular army, right? And like, this yeah. is this is the first rebel promotional, 
you know, mini, right? I mean, I think there's no question that Vader is the most, the best promo scope sculpt out of all of these so far. I don't think it's yeah, particularly agree. close, yeah, yeah. Per- personally. Um, yeah. And, but like, if if you have a Vader and you want a Luke because you only play rebels or something right like i think i think that there's there's value there outside of just monetary value no, I yeah mean, clearly it is worth less dollars because of the fact that it is more readily accessible it, it just creates an awkward situation i think like offering like that kind of trade like i don't know it it just yeah. it, to me it, it's been like to me it's been a volatile like week on the Facebook watching it unfold. Now the election didn't get to him, but dang man, this, this <laughs> promo loop did. Man, it really did. It really did. Um but uh yeah, I mean yeah, I think in terms of best sculpt it goes Vader and then like Obi Wan is like very hard to come Obi Wan's very rare. Like Obi Wan's hard to come by. I've searched, I've searched Mike, you sent me one like a couple of weeks ago and I had to really think about it. And it was like, I assume still... you didn't bid on it or whatever. I did not. No. Um, I, I ended up buying a gaming computer and monitor instead, which is probably the better choice if I'm being honest. And, um, and like six times more expensive at least. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, but it was more justifiable though. Like the one you were showing me, I think it was like 275 euros, which is like probably like what, 315 US dollars. It's like a quick change in my head and that, I think that was before shipping so like as much as I love Obi-Wan and as much as I love playing clones and as much as I love that sculpt it's still like a miniature that is not being put on a table right now because of real life stuff I think if we were playing real life games I would probably more be more apt to justify that purchase but right now I just was like no um and it's also something I would have to hide from my wife um, the gaming computer, I just, you know, that's something I can just be like, listen, I play games all the time. This thing will make its va- you know value back. And instead saying to my wife, Hey, I bought this $300 Obi-Wan alternate sculpt that I don't really need, but I really wanted it. Uh, probably wouldn't have as much legs. I don't think. But honey, it looks really cool. Yeah, no, uh, no, no, it that wouldn't, it would not have, no, it does not fly. <laughs> Yeah. And I mean, it, that one was in, in Germany. So it's yes. especially in North America, like physically, uh, I'm sure there are people in North America that went to Essen Spiel, but it's definitely a much smaller list than this, those people that went to Gen Con, for example. So, yeah. Uh, well, I also feel like, I also feel like the, like whoever went to Essen probably wouldn't go there to scalp. And I feel like whoever went to, Celebration because it wasn't Gen Con, it was Celebration, I think, right? It was Star oh, yes, Wars Celebration. I'm sorry, yeah. Star Wars Celebration. Yeah. yeah. So, like, think about how many people go to Celebration, how many of them actually play Legion, and how many of them were just buying it because it was there. You know what I mean? It, it, like, so that was like a comp. I think the Vader one was way more complicated than the Obi Wan one because Essen is an actual gaming convention, and Celebration is just like a whole Star Wars thing. And as we know, like throughout all of Star Wars fandom and, and all their fans, like scalping is like a scalping at those conventions is like a, a thing. A from time honored I, tradition. Yeah, from what I understand. I mean, I've never really paid attention to it until Legion, if I'm being honest. But then, like, you fall down that rabbit hole and you see that it's like like pin trading and stuff like that is like big for celebration and like 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 all those things like people would buy pins just to sell the pins on the second market and it just turns into like a whole snowball effect whereas you know with Essen it's it's probably a little bit different yeah and i think even with celebration was weren't they also giving away like a sabine pin or something they with, were. if you if you bought certain it was, so it was, so yeah, it was just over like the yeah. or just under rather the price of the the vader thing it was like 30 yeah. bucks and that's what vader was going for i if i remember if i'm being honest i thought that that vader was originally gonna be like 25 and then i ended up being 30 at the convention which i don't think was a coincidence that it was for that for that pin if yeah I'm being, then if i'm being honest and people were like i want this pin but i gotta buy something i guess i'll take that vader and it's somebody that had nothing no connection to legion whatsoever Ex- 
Exactly. But, and yeah. that's how I got my Star Wars Celebration Darth Vader <laughs> on eBay. <laughs> yep. All right. Well, restocks are in. Go check them out at your local store, hopefully, or at ffg.com if you need some Phase 2s, B2s, Sabres. I'm sure there's some other stuff that is restocked. Uh, not Arc Troopers, sorry. Um, Rude. <laughs> but... Yeah, a bunch of the other, like a few months ago stuff, like pre-pandemic releases are getting restocked. Which which actually is really good because if I remember correctly, Miniature Market was saying they weren't going to get restocks until February and it's November. So it feels like we're a couple months ahead of the curve on these restocks. Um, I mean, it it could also be that Miniature Market was inaccurate, right? No, Um, the rule is under promise, over deliver. Yeah, yeah, you know. <laughs> you know, you know. But you know what? For this metric, we're gonna be positive. We're gonna bring positive vibes. It was supposed that, to be that February. Is, that is positive. It was supposed to be February. Came out in November, and that's good. Yeah, I mean, yeah. All right, let's move on to our main topic. <laughs> it's time for Legion One Hundred and One. Class is in session. So we're going to continue our objective series discussion and talk about bombing run today. So how do you guys approach bombing run? Why don't we like first, because this is, this is a, you know, this is a vital asset subjective. It's one that is definitely favors a specific kind of list. So it might not be one that a lot of people have played. So why don't we first just like hit what bombing run is and then go into how you approach it. All right. I have. I actually have the card up, and why don't I read it off, and then I'm going to bring up a, a specific point about it that we can hit on later, but it, it's super important. Well, there's a couple of different things I guess we can discuss on the on the card because, like, setup is very important for bombing run. Um, let's go through it. Setup. After the deploy unit steps, starting with the blue player, each player places three claimed objective tokens in base contact with friendly unit leaders, that are within the player's deployment zone. Each unit cannot have more than one claimed objective token. Each trooper gains the action claim. All units gain the free action drop. Uh, Drop specifies flip one of your claimed objective tokens to its unclaimed side. At the end of the activation phase, each player may detonate one unclaimed objective token that was flipped to its unclaimed side with the drop ability by a unit that they control. And once you detonate those, they are removed from the table. Um, Victory. After an objective token detonates inside inside or within range one of a player's deployment zone, their opponent gains one victory token. Uh, Bombing runs three red dice, blast, suppressive, surge, crit. So there's a couple things of note here. Um, The most important thing to remember about bombing run, you have to be in your deployment zone. Um... Like if you infiltrate, if you scout, you cannot put a bombing run token on that unit. Um, So you need to be very, very well aware of that. Um, I think like the first time I played bombing run, I kind of like I was playing it in a proxy um, because it got spoiled. I think we spoiled it somewhere along the lines. I think Jay and Evan played a game and we proxied it and we didn't have the card in front of us and we forgot that part. Like I I like scouted Obi-Wan Kenobi and then like gave gave him a token, right? Like, like, oh, um, this is stupid. Wow, this is awesome. Um, Can't do that. That is against the rules. Um, Another thing of note that we can hit upon is incognito, which is important for K2 and eventually Maul's droids when they drop. If you give them a token, it takes incognito away. Um, So I think you have that. I think that was recently fact, actually, that you 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 actually cannot give them a token. Cannot give them a token. Yeah, they have to actually claim the token later on. To then and then they would lose incognito. You can't actually give them a token, yeah, because they don't they don't count. Yeah, they have to use the claim action to get it. Now that yeah, good clarification there. Um, so incognito is very wonky with bombing run because um, again K two and those malls droids are like oh well if I give them a token they didn't actually claim the token they keep in incognito well that's just a free bombing run score. Uh, it's not going to work that way, um, which is probably for the best. <laughs> Well, just thematically, picture, you know, the incognito is supposed to represent like an unassuming droid, right? Yeah. K2 looks like an imperial droid. Um, he's walking across 
the battlefield with this like gigantic bomb. Some stormtroopers are like, uh, did did we order a bomb like on Amazon <laughs> or something? I mean, is is this like the I don't know. I mean, I guess let's just see what happens, you know, when he gets to us. Um, like it, <laughs> it just doesn't really it doesn't hold up. It doesn't make sense thematically. It makes perfect sense thematically. Do you know what's going on? Probably just another drill. Yeah, right. I, <laughs> there you go. If it's if it's stormtroopers, I guess it makes sense. Speaking know? of speaking of K two, just real quick off topic comment. Those security droids in Fallen Order are straight up bastards. Okay, <laughs> bastards. Yo, yo, they're 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 tough. That's for they sure. They are bastards. <laughs> Anyways, um, <laughs> so bombing run. Um, it's obviously good for mobile units um, that want to travel the you know the battlefield, and if you can get short deployment zones, it's even better. Um, I mean. Well, I Sorry. think like well, I think rule of thumb, right? You think fast mobile unit and you think breakthrough, but I actually think most of the time you want bombing run on those units because Tauntauns, while are good on breakthrough, I feel like they're just way better on bombing run because they can kind of like do like that drive by, right? And they don't have to like end the game in the deployment zone. They can drive by, drop the tokens, and do all sorts of damage at the same time. And like the timing of it is totally different than breakthrough, um, so it, it it's it's interesting, I think. Yeah. So there's there's actually there's a super important nuance about bombing run that is not uh, like immediately apparent from the card, and it's that even though you have to be a trooper unit, a normal trooper unit to claim an unclaimed objective token, you can place the bombing run the bomb tokens, the claimed bomb tokens in base with base to base at the beginning of the game with any unit which includes creature troopers it includes speeder bikes you know tanks air any speeders unit. i'm in air speeders like yep yep yeah and so another thing well, i was gonna say another thing of note that since you're just discussing that is it is within range one it is not at range one so you have to make sure that when you drop that token the entire token is in that range band it, it has it's just like throwing a like a sabine bomb say or a boss bomb it has to stay within that range band it cannot be outside and at it has to be within yep accurate um there's another sort of important nuance rules wise on the card that's not super evident and it's that you do not have to there's there's two things you can only detonate one token around so if you want to score three victory points you got to start blowing them up at the latest by turn four, if not earlier. Um, and the second is that you don't have to have dropped that token on that round. So conceivably, you could drop all three tokens on round one, hypothetically, and then detonate them over the course of the following three turns without picking them up again, assuming your opponent doesn't get to them first, obviously. Yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's notable here, right, that... Um your opponent can pick up tokens that you've dropped, which is a very big deal on this objective. And generally, if your opponent at any point picks up one of the bombs you've dropped in this game on this objective, it's, you lose the over. game. <laughs> um, so um, that's that's an important piece to keep in mind here. I, I also think that this objective is very unique and that it is the only objective or condition card i think that um adds a weapon profile <laughs> to um to a unit i mean th this basically makes any unit into a pseudo sab unit um for once a game um which to be honest this is probably the best thing to happen to the airspeeder um ever including the airspeeder itself um like this 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 bomb upgrade is better than the airspeeder's gun frankly uh and i mean it's just uh, that sort of is what it is but um you know fast vehicles specifically airspeeder speeder bikes um you know anything that can kind of get in there i mean you, zach you mentioned tons uh 
similarly though taunts sometimes like don't quite make it to range one of the deployment zone sometimes um just because like they have to you know melee something before they get there um yeah whereas vehicles I... you just go right over the top right and you have that you've got that third move if you want it right like move 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 drop a bomb is the last action on turn one with some sort of compulsory move moving vehicle um is actually like like if you if you'd like you know stand by sharing aside drop a bomb in the middle of a ball of units at the end of turn 1 that hits them all with three red dice your opponent's in for a real bad day um i mean you know i don't know it's uh it's a game changer as far as like you need to spread your units out otherwise you'll get wrecked um if you're not careful well, I was yeah. going to say to your point, like the air speeder is also immune to the bomb. Yeah, I was just going to say yes, it's immune. Absolutely, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, I think it's it's the only unit <clears throat> that can carry the bomb and is actually immune to its effect, right? Um, yes. Just by the nature of, of how it works. Um, so it is uniquely good at doing this, assuming that it uh, survives its strafe. Um, which, I mean, like, generally the first strafe is not when the air speeder dies. It's it's after that is over is when it dies, right? So, um, frankly, if you're able to drop a bombing run bomb on top of your, like, six of your opponent's units with an airspeeder, you probably got your points back, um, I would think, most of the time, you know, unless they, like, save super well out of it. But, um, I mean, if you drop it on, like, a B1 horde, like, you're going to kill a lot of B1s. Like, a lot. Like, like 12 or 15, God, if only. <laughs> I just, I, I wish it was that simple. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it clearly isn't always that simple. And and if yeah. you're playing against an opponent that, like, has registered what is happening, they'll probably play against, like, figure figure out yeah. how, to, how to spread out against it, right? But um, I do think that, you know, we are living in a world where balling up um, isn't as punished as it used to be overall, right? Like... Sabine is not as good as she used to be, so so explosions is a lot less of a threat these days, which was the main reason you shouldn't ball up your army, um, you know, prior to it's, bombing run. It's still pretty good. It it is no doubt. In, in in fact, I think it's still like top five command cards in the game by yeah. by a lot. But it's it's not really about the card or her. It's more about the units that can hit her on the approach. No, no doubt, and I, and I do think that bombing run sort of suffers from the same sort of thing. But, um, you know, I I think that when we t talk about bombing run and how to properly play bombing run, I think standbys, whether they're shared or not, actually come up a lot. And and I think it's important to mention this because I don't think standby sharing is unique in hedging out bombs. They it does it better. But I do think that in a lot of cases, um, standbys are one of the ways, <clears throat> whether, whether it's on a phase two unit with Overwatch, sharing tokens, or it's on a B1 squad that can't share tokens, like standbys are a way to hedge out a bomb drop at a later stage during a turn when you can't do anything about it. And, and that is a very important tool you have in your kit to prevent somebody from just like coming in there and whacking you with, you know, 12 red dice at the end of your turn and you not being able to recover from it. So let me ask you guys, as far as weighing the balance between blowing stuff up and scoring victory points, if you have to choose between those two things, obviously it would be ideal to like blow a bunch of stuff up and score a victory point at the same time. But if you've got to choose, which which one are you weighting more heavily? In other words, like suppose you have a wide open section of your opponent's deployment zone where you can just run over there, drop the bomb, score a victory point, hit zero units. And then you have like a giant ball of units that is not within range one of their deployment zone. Which target do you choose and why? Um, for that me, is a loaded question. It, it's, it's, I mean, all things equal, the VP, VP or bust. Um, yeah, I agree. The first, the first determinant of the winner is VP. Um, if it is 
less likely that my opponent is going to score all three of their bombs, then maybe I'll consider sacri sacrificing one. But it's um, also it's sort of like it's sort of like bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. You know? Oh, we're going down that we're going down that hole again, David. We are going down that <laughs> hole again. Hawks in the bush. I don't know what you call it, <laughs> but it's sort of like the the, the I'm going to choose the the play that I know is going to give me a certain result rather than you know ironic when they say this rather than roll the dice i mean right <laughs> it's straight up it straight up comes to list composition um like let's say let's say you have r2d2 in your list and your opponent doesn't have r2d2 in his list or her list right <clears throat> you have a you have an extra victory point that you may or may not feel confident that you're going to score or at least you think you can score it let's say you address the table and you think you can get that victory point from R2-D2 and you have a unit that has a bomb. So if you think you could score two bombs and R2-D2 and then take the other bomb and hit hit your opponent, that that's, that's another alley I think you could explore because you're still going to score three VPs. And if you end up with the same points, you know, if you end up with going up for points killed, you'll win the game. So I think it's totally board dependent, list dependent, and like scenario dependent like it depends on how your opponent's moving their army it depends on how much they're threatening to score their bombs for you to make that decision to go either at them or towards the point now i think nine out of ten times you're going to go for the victory point i mean the game is won by victory points i get that um but i think it's i think it's one of those cases whereas we talked about variables last week um you know, discussing payload, bombing run has a lot of variables. Believe it or not, um, it's an, it's another objective that brings a lot of unknowns, uh, which basically vital assets just brings. It brings unknowns, um, like it brings chaos. If I, if I'm being honest, um, like danger close brings chaos. Uh, hostage exchange chaos. Bombing run chaos. Like there's a common theme is chaos. Um, I mean, like chaos makes for interesting games, right? It does. No, no, I'm not saying it as a bad thing. Um, competitively speaking, though, it can be. Um, you know, so at, like we discuss things in a vacuum is what I'm trying to get at, right? We're, we're a competitive, we're a competitive podcast for the most part, and when we discuss something, it's over the course of like eight to ten games in a tournament, right? Bombing run is one of those cards that the variables could really change the outcome of game, in my opinion. Um, I think you have to, th I think it's another, I I'm not saying it's as, I don't think you need to get as many reps as you do with payload. Payload, like we discussed last week, payload requires a lot of reps, but I do think bombing run is right behind payload. Whereas if you don't play, if you don't play bombing run enough and you play it at a tournament or in a very important game, it could bite you in the ass. Yeah, I mean, so I I'm gonna I'm gonna take issue with the um, if you've got R two in your list, you shouldn't you should kind of like think about it. I so I think if it was a year ago, I might agree with you, but the fact that games and tiebreakers are determined by margin of victory nowadays, um, I actually think speaks to the fact that you should generally score as many vps as possible yeah that's fair that's totally fair i mean i'm not thinking that way because i haven't really played in an mov yeah like if, if i were to play in a tournament tomorrow there's mov i would 1000 percent go for that fourth vp oh. over changing course yeah i and i guess to for me there's like there's two major scenarios where you're dropping the bomb on your opponent um <clears throat> generally the first is during the opening turns when they are at range one of their deployment zones themselves and you can do both right that's like the simple easy like you know two birds one stone david like you were talking about right and and like the other scenario is my bomb can't make it to score the objective i need I, it would be nice if it did something right and i think that like there comes a time in every game, or not in every game, but in, in every Legion player's life where they realize that they can't 
they can't score an objective the way they need to in order to win the game. And I actually think that this objective, unlike a lot of objectives, you're not immediately just dead sometimes because you can sort of use the bombs to prevent your opponent from scoring, even if you can't. Um, and I think that that's an interesting and unique way to use them. You know, if for whatever reason your carrier can't make their deployment zone, drop the bomb on top of them and blow them to smithereens, right? Um, to me, those are the two scenarios. Those are like the two most likely scenarios where you're dropping bombs on your opponent. You're not. You're never dropping a bomb on your opponent just to drop a bomb on your opponent. That's a recipe to lose the game a lot of the time. Um, you know, I mean, I'm not going to say that you can't win a game by just dropping all three bombs on top of your opponent's army and, and tabling them, because I'm sure somebody's going to do it at some point in, in a competitive game of Legion, and everybody's going to be like, oh, man, that's so cool, right? Um, <laughs> but that's kind of like magical Christmas land um, thinking when it comes to this objective. I mean, you raise a good point because you can't blow up a bomb that never got dropped, right? So if the bombs are all neutral because the enemy died without dropping them, then they don't get to score any VP. So I don't know what situation you'd run into. Maybe like you're on, actually, no, maybe you're on battle lines and you're set up facing each other, right? And so you're like going to drop a bomb on another, on your opponent's bomb carrier, and then that bomb carrier doesn't get the chance to drop because it didn't activate yet. And so you're, you're in a situation where it's like, yeah, sure, I lost one of my bombs, but now my opponent's bomb is neutral. Maybe I can steal that, or maybe my opponent never gets to pick it up again because I'm now covering it. So there's some, there's definitely some interesting plays there that aren't strictly just like bank your VP. But I think what a lot of people do is instead of taking the path of most resistance, which is setting up directly facing each other, a lot of people are going to try to avoid each other on bombing run and try to like keep their bombs away. And that's a lot easier to do on, especially on the deployments that, that seem to be favored for bombing run, like disarray, for example, you're probably going to set up opposite corners. It's actually pretty rare that people set up across from each other on disarray, I find. Um, or they'll set up where they share a long edge. That's another, another thing they do. Um, I was going to say the battle lines, of course, favors it. Hemmed in favors it. I haven't actually played bombing run on hemmed in. I would be really curious to see how that plays out. Cause it, that's, it's that's actually, wild. um, so I've found personally bombing run on hemmed in significantly favors the blue player. Yes. Um, be, just purely on the fact that the blue player has a deployment zone that they can go bomb that's empty. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. And the red player has to come and beat you up in order to drop yeah. their bombs. You know, um, yeah. it's, it's not quite that simple, but I think to your point, David, I think a lot of people, when, when you're originally setting up on bombing run, similar to other objectives like sabotage the moisture evaporators, you really need to, identify who the beatdown is because if if someone does not identify who the beatdown is i think you end up kind of with, with the toilet bowl situation which i yep. think is super common and also super wrong <laughs> um a lot of uh, most of the time a lot of what the time what happens is somebody brings like a triple speeder bike list or something similar that has like three fast units that can drop bombs quickly, right? That's kind of the list that likes to drop bombing run. Same sort of list that, that likes to bring breakthrough, right? And the the person that's not that list generally needs to realize that they need to kind of like frontal assault the other army, specifically their bombing run units, if at all possible. Like you're not in avoidance mode. You're in... I. I'm red player. I have to like kill their stuff. They're definitely going to drop their bombs. And I may not because my list is not made for that. Right. Um, and unlike a lot of other objectives, you can't just table your opponent on bomb bombing run and expect to win. I mean, like, and when I say table, I mean like nearly table, like as long as your opponent has a unit left on the table, if they blew up their three bombs and you didn't like finish the job, you're, you're down and out. And, and the lists that are tailor-made for bombing run are going to finish their bombing run on, like, turn four. Yeah. It, 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 rem it brings me back to a game that we uh, you and I casted, Mike, in, in an Invader League. Uh, Alexander, uh, I think with the Blood Phoenix, was playing against JJ's Juggernauts. 
and Alexander had two air speeders and I don't think he realized that he needed to be the control and, and not like, and like he, but what we mean is like, we discussed it during the game a lot was he was being very cautious with his air speeders. And when JJ was stuck, in his de- beat down. Sorry, beat down. Sorry, I meant, sorry, yeah. I meant to be, uh, sorry, not, I meant to, he meant to be uh, yep. beat down, not control. Sorry, continue. And JJ was stuck, like the way JJ deployed, like he was in like one corner of the, of the board in Mimban. And like, if Alexander just took his one air speeder and, and brought the bomb in, maybe it wouldn't score, but it would kind of like get the clones really stuck in that corner of the board where the other air speeder can then come up and kind of, you know, score or do the same thing. And Instead, he kind of played like the long game with the airspeeders, which ended up getting them killed because like they needed to be like quick attack. Like they needed to just zoom down the board, get the bombing, whether they score the VP or do some damage or, you know, take the suppressive and get them stuck in a deployment zone. Because if I remember, if I remember correctly, JJ was running like Rex, Padme, Obi-Wan and R2. So like that kind of list while it has like mo- like units that has to move, it's not like a list that's going to do a lot of damage to those air speeders quickly. So like, it's like, you have to like realize that like send that bomb in, score the VP or hit them and get them stuck. And then they're going to have problems scoring their VPs. And it's definitely one of those, you know, that I don't know if there's a VOD of that one, but it's, it's one of those games where it's a clear cut thing where you have to kind of realize early on in the game, how you need to approach the objective. Um, which I think is probably the case for most bombing run games. Um, I think turn zero determines bombing run quite a bit. Yeah, it's it's worth sort of redefining for people in case you you missed our beatdown versus control episodes. What we mean when we use those terms? Uh, it's a term for magic. It's it's got a slightly different meaning in magic, but as we generally apply them to Legion, the control player is the one for whom the status quo is acceptable. Like if both players essentially score the objectives they're expected to score and don't interact with each other, the control player is the one that's going to win. So the perfect like stock example of that is moisture evaporators. If both players have two safe evaporators that they're going to be able to fully interact with, then blue player is the control player. Because if both players interact with their evaporators and nobody kills anything, blue player wins. So it's on red player to either kill something or tag one of their opponent's evaporators. And that that interaction is in play in more nuanced ways in other objectives, but it's especially important for bombing run because bombing run is another ob- objective where each player starts essentially tied, right? Each player has access to three victory points that they can score. Now, a lot of things can happen over the course of the game to change that calculus. But generally speaking, you know, if, if you get what we described as like a toilet bowl situation where both players just kind of pass each other and they each score three victory points. If they don't interact with each other after that, blue player wins. So like on the disarray situation, if you get a toilet bowl like that, both players drop their three bombs, both players score their objectives and say it's like turn four by that point. Blue player can just kind of hole up in whatever corner of the board they ended up in and be like, all right, you know, points are tied. You got to come kill something or I'm going to win. Um, and that's not a great situation for red player. So, you know, I think it was Mike that said, basically, if, if you're toilet bowling, one player has kind of misassessed which role they are. In that situation, red player has not fully understood that, like, from the start of the game, they need to be the ones interacting with blue player's army. This is one of the reasons disarray is so terrifying when you're fighting, um, uh, you know, listed of the, the three fast units in them. Because no matter where you set up, they can just turn and go the other way. And that's especially true for blue, who's usually bidding into it. And that's really why units like Tauntauns were so advantaged. And not only that, just right also forces you to deploy a unit in the opposite zone. And whatever that is over there is probably dead unless you've tucked it away really well. And so you're already in a situation where you're forced to give up a certain number of points. You just have to figure out how many you're willing to give up. <laughs> so it's just like sort of like a double advantage in a way for blue that's on disarray on bombing around with the three fast units is that not only are you controlling the, not only are you the control, you are also asking the red player, how many points are you comfortable losing while I win my objective? <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, it, it's definitely important to know that like the unit that you put the, your sacrificial 
you know yeah like, like put it in quotes it's not strictly sacrificial right I, I, most of the time it is right yeah um, against tons absolutely <laughs> well, and, and that's the thing the yeah. units that are good at bombing run tend to make the fact that that unit is sacrificial like in a hundred percent certainty right because whether it's tons or speeder bikes or air speeders like they just go snap that off immediately while dropping the bombs right right and, and like <laughs> so and and not only that but those fast units they guarantee that they kill that you know sacrificial unit they also a lot of the time open the door for their own sacrificial unit to run away because now it has an avenue of escape away from the enemy army, right? Yeah, so, so it's like a triple whammy almost. Yeah, so and, and that's important to also understand as sort of like a mirror breaker thing. If you're playing Bombing Run with two lists that want to play Bombing Run um, on Disarray, which is, you know, um, like the, the list that's able to like capture the sacrificial or gets the, the sacrificial, you know, thing in the corner that costs more all of a sudden becomes blue and it's important to realize you know when you throw it over there maybe you want to throw a rebel trooper team over there because they cost less than a strike team right um and and that sort of calculus is important when you're figuring out how you're going to interact with your opponent over the course of the game and whether you end up being the control player or the beatdown player in whatever situation you end up in Yeah, I feel like bombing run more than almost any other objective significantly advantages certain lists and significantly disadvantages other lists. It's it's the objective, I think, where you have the biggest possibility for there to be a huge gap in a particular army's ability to actually do the objective. Yeah, I feel like I feel like it's one of those cards that is going to be cut a lot. Um mainly because mobile armies aren't as popular as like gun lines will call it like mobile armies are still like 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 kyle you probably bring bombing run your dooku stats list right um that's like an edge case of a list that is a gun line that also has mobile units in it um whereas like i feel like bombing run is very very good for like a mobile skew and usually if you have a mobile skew, you're running tons or air speeders or speeder bikes. And a lot of those times, like your core, your core units are kind of like, like your corpse are like, you're kind of like they're light, right? So your gun line's not as thick. Um, so like, I just think like, you're going to see a lot of lists, like cut it. Like if you're not running, if you're playing rebels and you're not running tauntauns or an air speeder, you're not bringing it um clones not bringing it unless you're running like a bark skew which power to you if you are barks aren't even very good at this <laughs> no yeah yeah yes yeah. no seriously yeah. but that's that's for another discussion um right so like and then like droids if you're not running staps i mean double aat i could maybe see it being in the list but the, the aats don't want to move they want to shoot they want to shoot and shoot and shoot you they don't want to be moving across the battlefield um, I could see maybe like a clone player thinking that if they have a saber tank, they want bombing run. Uh, I'm going to give you a newsflash. You don't, that saber tank does not want to move. That saber tank wants to shoot. Um, because I don't know if you haven't, if you've played a saber tank, but like the side arcs on the saber tank in the, in the rear arc, it's like the grand Canyon. Like you move, you're going to get shot and they're going to get impact. That's just how it works with the saber tank. Yep. Um, you know, like droids if like i said if you have staps sure if not i mean maybe maybe there's an edge case for you know for droidicas right um if you're bringing you know droidicas maybe you bring in go into ball mode and you run them up the board and that's fine but like outside of that no and then imperials it's speeder bikes and may, it, like if it could interact with infiltrate well then obviously isf but there's a reason it doesn't interact with infiltrate because that'd be ridiculous. Um, so I just feel like those, while those units themselves are all somewhat decently set up in this meta, they're not overflowing in the meta um, right now. I mean, Tons on the face of it are good, but they struggle against clone standby. So you don't really see them a lot right now. 
Um, Staps, we're seeing more and more of. They're obviously a really good unit, and that's great. So maybe you see them bring bombing run. Bikes, I know some folks are playing bikes right now, but I don't know if bikes are really strong in this meta for a lot of reasons. They're just kind of squishy in this meta. Um, you know, air speeders. I don't, I don't really have much to say about an air speeder, unfortunately. Um, land speeder, I haven't seen one in about a, a year and a half, it feels like, when that was when David got blown up. Um, so <laughs> yeah, like, I know. So he like, rolled man, that is five old, grits. I'm, yeah, I'm that like, is some old salt right there. I'm, I'm actively, I'm actively <laughs> not trying to say bad things about these units that want bombing run. Uh, um, oh, you know, I guess this one thing I haven't said is Mandalorians. If you're running, uh, running a Mandalorian list, um, yeah, you want bombing run. Yeah, Mandos could probably do bombing run real well. Bombing run for Mandos seems really good because they have the save to back them up. Um, but like, and they're fast. And they're fast. Yeah, they're fast. So I just think while it's a card that really favors lists, those lists aren't as popular in the meta, unfortunately. So I agree with everything you just said for the most part, I think. Um, I think like the one list that like you absolutely shouldn't be taking this card in is like a short line. <laughs> like no, like dude, absolutely. If, if, you're, no, if you're playing em- an Empire gun line, like <laughs> you, gross. You do everything in your power to never ever play this objective. Uh, uh, if you're if you're red and you're playing on bombing, or just throw the three bombs on your mortars as a meme and just hope for the yeah. best. <laughs> so I actually think there's some like real jankness that you can kind of get going with. Um, you can put ascension cables on a bunch of units and like kind of treat them as like pseudo mandos that have jump. If it like, you could do something like really kind of gimmicky with like veers and like three units with, with ascension cables. And I don't know, or what's the Cassian's got a card that recovers too. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, too much. Much. Yeah. I mean like <clears throat> I'm kind of being a little out there at the moment, but <laughs> I mean, I, I do think that, like, you could you could do something a little crazy like that. Um, but, yeah, I mean, you just want things that are fast, that don't care about terrain. Believe it or not, a list that would, like, that would like Bombing Roll would be Jay's Double Heavy that he brought to LVO. Like, that 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 ATST in the tank, like... I gotta, it's I not, gotta disagree it's with that. It's not bad. Well, well, I'm not saying it's, it's necessarily good. I'm just saying it's not necessarily bad. Compared to other imperialists, like like it probably be the only other thing viable than speeder bikes is what I'm really getting at. So would be that kind of list. Just for the audience's, uh, I guess, awareness, uh, Jay brought a tank ATST list to LVO, um, and that, that was, was like top eight with it. He did, he did. I just like there were no other units in that list that did anything, <laughs> you know, and there, I don't know. Those units needed to be shooting things, not driving into their parts to play. That, zone. That's the issue, right? Is that a lot of the vehicles in this game want to be shoot, shoot, shoot rather than move, move, well, drop a bomb. And, and that's where I think the com- units with compulsory are specifically good at this objective. Right. And I actually think that the best lists for this are actually the, the droid lists that run like the two two or three staps because i think they're the only real army right now that can run a fast mobile element that is not in spite of the gun line right like it's yeah. like cis can run dooku and a gun line and staps and it's like this is fine we have ever we're not sacrificing anything right whereas in any other army, when you're talking about putting a fast mobile element together, like the rest of your army suffers to the point where it just loses straight up gunfights with every other army in the game, which is a bit of a problem. I will say, so I, I've been running that list for Team League and doing well with it, but I've also never been blue player because it's pretty hard to bid with Dooku Staps. Um, if you look at what's theoretically possible with a 55 point commander, and Maul, you can do something similar. And Maul is really good at bombing run because he's so good at stealing bombs. Um, but again, it's kind of it's a red player list. It's really difficult to bid with a list like that. So while bombing run is it's solid for you, I don't think I've I've ever played bombing run with that list just because I'm always red player. Um, I don't think I've ever been blue player. It's interesting because like I'm assuming. So obviously, since you haven't played it, it's kind of more of a theory, right? The theory I have in my head is that you score with you try and score with the two staps and then you kind of linebacker with Dooku and stop your opponent from scoring. 
And if your other B1 makes it, they make it. I mean, that, I'm assuming that's how you play it with that kind of yeah. a list. And it doesn't seem bad. Let's put it that way, you no. know? I, I also think, you know, we've talked a lot recently about the upgrade card Force Choke. Um, Force Choke is a big deal when it comes to bombing runs, specifically when we start talking about, you know, the Maul and to a lesser extent Anakin. Um, you know, just because Maul can infiltrate like on top of your army and make sh- make it so that you drop your bomb in your deployment zone, right? Like, I mean, not that not that that is like super likely to happen every game, but like, there is a there is a likelihood that you are never gonna make it across the field without dropping your bombs to force choke at least once, and you need to like be aware of that situation because it is gonna be a much more like at the at the current stage of the game as is pre Anakin pre Maul. Like you only get force choked when you get close to your opponent's army, which which tends to happen on turns like four, five, and six. Like the the that whole thing is going to change once we see Maul. Like you're gonna get force choked on turn two, and you need to be able to deal with that. The good news Makes here, sick. the good news here is they're not gonna be force choking your heavies. They're gonna be force choking your unit leaders, um, so that you drop the bomb. So there's like a little bit of a give take there, but, um, you know, I I was saying this is a joke to someone today. Like is the T 47, the new meta because it's immune to force choke and immune to range one and melee. But then like, I was thinking about, it's like, man, you know, that's actually a good point. (laughs) You can't force choke a a T 47 and you can't make it drop a bomb. So I wonder like, you know, if who knows, who knows? (laughs) I think I have a couple of notes here. One, the more and more we discuss Magical Christmas Land, but then we discuss Magical Christmas Land with Maul, those are two totally different things because Magical Christmas Land for Maul is actually doable. Like, Mike, you say that that opportunity is not going to be there as often as you think, but at least it's there more than, like, the other Magical Christmas Lands. Like, it is a real fear that he can mess up your bombing run the way you're speaking of. Well, like, it re- it's there. The- I think the the thing that we need to bear in mind here, and I also want to hit David's point about the airspeeder real quick. Uh, Mm -hmm. Like, so yes, it it, the malls is a little bit of a magical Christmas land, like we're talking, but not in the same sense that like it's unlikely to happen. It's that you can choose to have it happen. It's just mall will probably die as a result, right? Right. Um, Right. Like a lot of the time. I mean, there there are scenarios where you can keep them safe, no doubt. Like that's you can do some you know, crazy stuff with them all with like force push and the fact that he gets three actions and all that jazz. Um, but a lot of the time, if he gets in there on turn two, you should, I mean, you should be ready to lose him. The thing is you're playing a separatist list. You can afford to lose a 180 point unit and like still win the game. Cause you've got 70 B ones on the other side of the table. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean like, and David, to your point about the airspeeder, I think if every game of Legion was bombing run, the airspeeder would be dope. Yeah, it would be amazing, <laughs> like, right? Yeah, like, but that, that's you know. the problem, right? It's such it's such a niche, a niche thing. Well, that well, that was my second point. Was we keep discussing mobile units, mobile units, mobile units. You need to have. We've, I mean, you guys have talked about it on the cast before I came on the cast, and we probably have hit upon it since I've come on the cast. Now, you have to have more than one plan, mm-hmm. um, because if you go in with Plan A my air speeder is going to fly into my opponent's zone and score. And then that air speeder dies and that bomb does not go off. You are going to lose that game because guess what? That air speeder so far away from your army and so close to your opponent's army, you have no way to react to that bomb being dropped. Um, and it's important to realize that if your mobile unit is going to go for the point, you have to be able to react if something goes south. Um, like, I think speaking, so like on this note, I actually think there might be, there might be merit to putting bomb, like let's say you're running a Tom list, there might be merit to putting bombs on your naked rebel troopers rather than your Tauntauns because I've noticed more and it's still good for a Tom list. I'm not saying it's bad for a Tom list. It's good for a Tom list. But I've noticed more that your tons, and Mike, you brought it up earlier, uh, and I feel the same way, is that your tons, if they have a bomb, have too many things to do. 
they want to either melee or shoot or go a different direction than the bomb. And what you can do is you can kind of like sleight of hand your taunts to kind of go at your opponent's army and let your rebel troopers just kind of, you know, walk towards where they need to go. And now your tauntauns have one less thing that they have to worry about, right? Which is scoring a VP, dropping bombs, surviving the bomb blast because the bomb's going to hit them. There's a lot of different things. Now, obviously, if the bomb hits them, they're going to have two dodge tokens, which is good um, because it's at the end of the activation phase and you're going to get those tokens and all that jazz. Um, But I think the key is to realize that if your mobile unit has to do other things, it's okay to put that token on something else is my point. And, and make sure that if you put it on something that's squishy, you have something around them that can kind of insulate it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's very important to note that pigeonholing your units, like, so it, I think, and this kind of goes back to the fact that I think the Separatist list is the best at this because the Separatist list has, like, several avenues of winning the game. Whereas, and that don't strictly rely on the, like, it doesn't need the staps to win the game, right? If the staps are, like, screwing off in the corner, dropping bombs, like, they can, the list can kind of, like, get away with them doing that for a turn or two. Whereas, like, a lot of these unit lists that are, like, running double air speeders or running speeder bikes or whatever, um, like, those are the main, like, punch up the gut they've got. Like, that's where their firepower is and if you sacrifice that component you just got a bunch of units that don't do anything um you still have to like play a normal game of legion to some extent like dropping the bombs is important and if it wins you the game it wins you the game but um if you drop the bombs and your units that do damage to your opponent die and you don't do enough damage to your opponent in the course of dropping the bombs, they're just going to walk across the board, drop their bombs, and shoot your units off the table, and you're going to lose, right? So you do have to strike a balance between, like, in, in the example that you had, you can kind of treat your rebel troopers like like pseudo R2-D2s, right? Like, the reason taunts and R2 work so well is the taunts provide the time for R2 to get across the board, it, I think you were kind of alluding to the same thing with Rebel Troopers, right? Um, and, and I think that that makes a lot of sense when it comes to, like, figuring out how you're going to deal with a specific situation on Bombing Run. Yeah, so I guess, I guess the, a shorter way to put it might be be open-minded about what units you put your bombs on, right? And don't always be staple to this notion that, like, I have to put the Bombing Run bombs on the fast guys. You know, you have to kind of read the board and see what would be appropriate. And, and that comes with experience and just comes with, like, just remaining open-minded to some different possibilities. Yeah, and I, and I think a lot of it also comes down to the durability of the unit that you're diving with, right? And in how much your opponent is prepared for the dive, right? Like, if you've got three sets of speeder bikes and it's turn two and they've all got all your speeder bikes have bombs... And you're like ready to get in there, but your opponent took like three or four standbys in his Imperial gun line list and is like ready for you. Maybe wait a turn, right? Like, w- w- <laughs> like wait until your shores get up there and start murdering things, and they have to shoot back and have to do other things. Like you can't, you can't really just expect. And I and I think that the the biggest um, failure in a lot of games of bombing run I've seen is a lot of people think, oh. I'm going to drive my fast unit into the thick of my opponent's army that's also at range one of their deployment zone and drop the bomb at the end of the turn and everything's going to be hunky-dory and I'm going to win. And the fact of the matter is that against a competent opponent, like that is not the reality of the situation you're in. You have to be like making them spend their actions on doing other things. If, if the only thing that you give them is the ability to focus on your unit that's going to drop the bomb at the end of the turn. Well, it's not going to drop the bomb at the end of the turn the way you want. And I think that that's a very important thing to grasp. You need, it's, it's kind of a poke at the end of the turn after you've like traded blows um, with your opponent. If, if you're giving up the trading blows portion to drop the bomb, you're probably not going to have a good go of it. Yeah, like in that situation you describe, if if it's turn one and the bulk of your army can't interact with your opponent's army, 
you're going to end up diving that speeder bike or whatever it is into the middle of 10 activations worth of dodges and standbys, which whether that's a clone player or not is going to suck for that unit. So, you know, the bomb's not going to do a lot. It's going to bounce off all those dodge tokens and they're probably going to get shot by a lot of range two standbys. So you have to, you have to time it such that they can't do something like that. It's also, we haven't really hit this yet, but activation count is really important in bombing run because of, you know, being able to go last is generally important, but it's even more important with bombing run because going last is literally how you score. Yeah, and, and it also, like, if you out-activate your opponent, it gives you the chance to strip those standby tokens off off their ball of units. Again, regardless of if they're clones or not, like, if they've got three standbys up, you like you your speeder bikes are not, not going to be able to take, you know, two death troopers and a short trooper shot before it drops the bomb. It's just going to drop the bomb, and then your opponent's going to pick it up. Like, so you've got to figure out a situation where you can make it so that they don't have the time to take the standby tokens or you can shoot them off and i mean like some gun lines get to close to range four to do that others get to close to range three but you can't be like you know sitting in your own deployment zone waiting for them to come to you while your dudes drop the bombs it's just it's not really how this objective works um, yeah and on and on the flip side if you're like defending someone entering with like a speedy unit and you out activate them you can threaten like if you know the area that they're going to go with the bomb, you can threaten them by keeping a unit with like a face up. Like let's say you know like they're trying to go take the speeder bike to a certain area of your deployment zone, right? You face up the or you face up your like troopers that are in that area, so you can last with them and try and claim that token if it's in that vicinity. Um, like you can kind of try and box out your opponent from dropping that token in a safe area. I mean, obviously, edge case. I'm not saying it's you know going to happen often, but you can at least give yourself the opportunity to do that if you're defending from someone with with a mobile unit and, and you happen to out activate them. I mean, the thing that I find with mobile lists with speeder bikes and like tauntauns is that they typically are high activation, which is good for them, right? Um, so they kind of get you know the twofold of it, the high act and the mobile. Um, it just turns out that patience ends up being a virtue, but you can't be too patient at the same time because you, because of how the timing of scoring works. So like you, you just have to be able to assess risk is basically, basically you have to bombing run is like the game mode where you probably have to assess the most risk uh, probably in any of the game mode. And you know, the more we talk about this, the more it's becoming clear to me that like, like you just have to have a plan for all six turns. Like there's no like there's no shortcut, right? And I think it really is going to separate people who are like, you know, A tier from S tier. Really, it's like, do you have a plan for all your all six turns? Are you organizing your drop orders? Are you reading the board? Are you doing the sort of mental? I don't know. Math is not really strictly what I'm talking about. Kind of the calculation, right? It's it's that's really important. And like the more we talk about this and, and I've, I've seen it from people I've cast that I've seen it from our discussions, I've seen it from even, you know, blog articles we've written in the past about this objective. Um, you just have to have a plan. And if you don't have a plan, if you don't have some idea of what you're doing for all six turns, you're just going to be, you're just going to be down, you know, you're going to be behind already. Yeah, I mean, I think to some extent that goes for like most objectives, right? But I do think to this objective, it it speaks a little bit more that like this is an objective where the window with which you have to score is is insanely narrow in comparison yeah. to. I mean, like rather when you once you kind of like get towards the end of the game, it gets a lot narrower than other objectives, right? You can't score four victory points on the last turn uh, because you you know, did a VAP four times like you can on other objectives. You can't get four units into the end zone and score on breakthrough. You only, on the last three turns, you have a window of one victory point each. And, like, that's it, unless you've got, like, secret mission or bounty or whatever, right? And, and 
yeah, like if if your pl- plan hasn't started to come together and by turn four, you're probably sunk. I'm going to get some flack for even saying this, but I'm going to touch this third rail. Okay, here we go. Um, oh, boy. The difference between getting a fifth round and a sixth round in a tournament. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, yeah. Is, no, totally, totally. Yeah, it's like you better hope you scored that objective early. Yeah, <laughs> I, mean, yeah I mean, sometimes. Oh, tournament, I would think if. <laughs> oh, man. It, it, Speaking of this third rail, like it, 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 no, I mean not to like to like really harp on it, but like the game is definitely totally different if you're not expecting to go to six. Let's yeah, if, if you made a six turn plan and you detonate your first bomb on turn four, it's possible that's not going to be good enough. Yeah, there's a there's a, a small chance. It's, it's the small. Uh, the unwritten contract situation. Yeah, well, it's it's worth noting that I think we haven't really talked about this yet. But this is a, so there's a, like a pace of play that's like, and I don't mean this in terms of, actually, let me talk about it like this. Tempo is something we probably should talk about a little bit more, but I think specifically pertains to this objective specifically. If your opponent looks like they're going to drop a bomb on turn two, you similarly should try and drop a bomb on turn two if at all possible and keep the tempo with your opponent as far as scoring objectives and things of that nature goes because um if you don't go to turn six like you 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 don't want to be caught in a situation where your opponent has beat you on tempo and you lost because the game ended prematurely due to a timer right um and and bombing run is uh, vaps is in a similar boat on this right like if your opponent is doing their vaps and it's turn two maybe you should do your vaps you know like yeah. um i am i'm a big um kind of supporter of do your objectives early and often um in tournaments specifically because sometimes you don't get to turn six uh that's kind of like a different conversation but like i think tempo bombing run is is like a super tempo oriented objective like in a huge way um, and you know, um, whoever is kind of setting the tempo or pace for the game is really in the driver's seat, um, in, in a way that you're not in a lot of other objectives. And what I mean by that is the person that's like scoring first, the person that is, uh, again, this is kind of like the person that's sort of playing control. In, in this situation is often setting the tempo, right? They're like, I can easily score here. I'm going to score on turn two. You, it's, it's on you to, to catch up and turn, turn it against me, right? Um, you can basically put pressure on your opponent in a timed game, basically, uh, to kind of react. Like if, like, if you know that you can do that and put your opponent on, on quote-unquote back foot, it it's good for you in a sense. Um, but I mean, it's obviously we're talking in a binary turn six Legion game. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's a good thing to note that that's not necessarily always the case. Um, well, it's, it's important to know that generally the person that is significantly ahead on tempo is going to win regardless of what turn the game ends on. Right. Like, if, if you are controlling the tempo of the game and you are the one scoring the victory points often and early and, and kind of setting the pace of where you should be, you shouldn't get caught with your pants down, so to speak, because, the, you know, the, the judge called, you know, time in the round, right? Um, I just, yeah, I think that's just important to, to note. I do think it's probably important to note that like margin of error in bombing run is probably the most thin, like a mistake in bombing run could essentially cost you the entire game. And that could, that could be the case in a lot of objectives. Don't get me wrong, but more so in a more so in bombing run, because that unit that is trying to, let's say if that unit is forward trying to score and that's where your mistake is. And that bomb is now dropped in a spot. Like, and we've alluded to it several times in this cast, but if that bomb is in a spot that you can't really get to quickly or your opponent can get to like, you can like, and I think Mike, you've said it before you drop the bomb. It's over. Like, like that, that is a, that is a small 
that is a small like window of error if you really think about it because the game is a dice game right like you can take your mandalorian let's say you take your mandalorian unit and you put them into a spot and you're like i've got mando saves they're not gonna die to this sh- you know i'm gonna take one short trooper shot to the face they're not gonna die a lot of averages my dice won't fail me red dice have blanks on them like they could die and they might drop that bomb and then all of a sudden the game slipped on its upside and you have no way to turn it back over. Like, whereas like if you make a mistake on VAPS, right, you can at least have an, have an attempt to make that back up, right? You make a mistake on boxes. Um, you have ways you can kind of bring it back. Um, breakthrough, you make a mistake, you can still make up for it. Um, I can go down the list. Um, Intercept's a little bit different. Mistake and intercept can kind of cost you the game too, like because of how scoring works on it. But I just feel like if if you make a mistake on bombing run, that's like a, it might seem minor, but ends up major, you're, the game's over. And that's something to keep a note that, that the variable that is most important, which is winning the game can kind of hinge on dice. Well, um, and a lot of, well, I mean, there's a lot more to positioning, it that, positioning, positioning really is the key. Yeah. Bombing run, I think is, is really the only objective where after an objective token is scored, it gets removed, right? Like the, nobody, yeah. after you detonate a bomb, nobody can score that bomb ever again. So like if, if your opponent steals one of your bombs, that's basically it. That's game over. Because now your ceiling is two victory points and his ceiling is four victory points. And that bomb that he just stole and detonated is, it's not in play anymore. You can't, it's not like a box where if you lose a box, you can chase it down and take it back. No, those that's are the a, best games. Oh. Yeah, they are. <laughs> Does that mean you instantaneously lose? Uh, it doesn't well, mean you instantaneously I'm... lose, but it's it's yeah. much more of an instant lose than many objectives are right well yeah then say like giving up a bounty or something yeah comparative comparative to the other objectives it is probably the more it is probably the case of the most instantaneous losing scenario because is how i feel i mean the fact of the matter is if your opponent picks up a, a bomb they should pretty much like instantaneously drop it if they can detonate it strictly so that you can't pick it up because chances are they can pro you can probably kill the unit that that stole it right before they get a chance to actually score with it so why not just detonate it in the middle of your army because that's probably where it already is right i mean i mean like whatever no we're, we're heading into the holiday season so like i made my family disappear but instead it's i made my opponent's token disappear and it's never coming back unlike the McAllisters, they they did come back but the subjective token is not coming back yeah, and, and with that being said, if you're able to steal your opponent's bomb, it is often right to just to just ex- blow it immediately regardless of where it is on the board just to get it off the board. Like, getting it off the board is often way more than enough um, if, if you're properly scoring the objective. The conversation changes if, like, you're failing to achieve your objective already, but, but, but most of the time it is very right to just be like okay i'm gonna drop it you know the the game is much harder for you now if not impossible well gents any final bombing run thoughts yes absolutely the patriots are up 13 to 10 (laughs) (laughs) that is not a bombing run thought it is because we are bombing baltimore By three, by three points. Hey man, hey, with hey. with this Patriots team, that's a big deal. <laughs> One field goal. Okay. Yeah, but I mean, I, I have to say we're kind of we're kind of uh, to use sports my my local sports radio. Uh, we're kind of take committed, Mike. We kind of need them to lose so we can blame Kyle. I agree. I agree. Yeah, we're we're, we're take much, we're take we're very much we are that. committed to that take. Um. I mean, it's kind of a win-win. Either we get to bash Kyle on the next cast, or we won the game, and <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is hey, this is I, like the. I was gonna say, I'm it's like, like the, the Patriots curse. Uh, that's fine with me. You know, I'm not <laughs> I'm a Patriots sure, fan. I'm sure it is. You and everybody else in the world's like, yeah, get them. Oh. 
Mike and I are just like Mac and it's always sunny in Philadelphia. We're playing, we're playing all angles. So we don't lose. Yeah. You have to create situations. that are always win-win like picking up your opponent's bombs, right? See, we turn it into bombing run, Kyle. There you go. All right. Well, we are the notorious scoundrels. I'm Kyle. I'm Mike. I'm David. I'm Zach. See you next week.